Hello and welcome to Series 8 of Richard Haynes Leicester Square Theatre Podcast, brought to you on video, very kindly, by all the people who contributed to our Kickstarter campaign, raising loads of money. It was ridiculous, so I'm very pleased about that. Thank you. If you want to contribute, this is all free on audio and video. Uh, if you want to contribute to help us make more, there are lots of different ways of doing that. Go to gofasterstripe.com slash badges. If you make a one-off donation... Uh, either for a badge or just without a badge, all of that money will be channeled back into the next series of Rahul Lestapa, Rahul Lestapa. If you want to help us make another series of As It Occurs To Me, which we're hoping to do on video next year in 2016 at some point, then go to the monthly badges, www.gofasterstripe.com slash badges. It's the same site, but go and pay a pound or more monthly and all that money will add up and hopefully help us to make As It Occurs To Me again. Uh, or you can... Uh, come and see me on tour. I'm doing a show called Happy Now. Go to richterring.com slash happy underscore now slash tour and you can see if I'm coming near to you. There's lots of other little things like you can go to eBay sometimes and I sometimes sell things on there which again that money goes into the podcast. We might start selling some things on gofasterstrike.com uh, which will help fund future episodes as well. And I'm sure we'll do another Kickstarter next year for more the, of both Rahul Estepa and A. Artema. You can do your own shouting out of those names. Anyway, let us sit back and enjoy. Thanks to all those lovely people on Kickstarter. You are terrific. Thank you so much for your help. Uh, me talking to podcast rival Stuart Goldsmith. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome... Oh, sorry, hold on, I'll start again. Oh, I forgot how to do it, I forgot how to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who is very disturbed about the, the certain people who are trying to stop robot sex happening, and that has become a big news story, I think, as a result of this podcast. Is Richard Harry. <laughs> it's not taking this seriously. Hello! Hello! We're back. We're back. Welcome uh, to Series 8 of Rich Tony's Leicester Square Theatre Podcast. Or as just recently, some of the cooler kids have begun. I was down at the skateboard park by, um, <laughs> just on the uh, South Bank. And the kids down there, they were calling it Rehearsal Lester Per. And uh, <laughs> it's on. So, um, it's, so, yeah, Series 8, thank you very much to everyone who donated to the Kickstarter. That's um, amazing. We raised over £50,000. Uh, it might have been even more than that. I don't know how much it was in the end, but it, it's enough to pay for this to make it free for all the people at home. So they're laughing at you, you idiots. Uh, and, uh, and thank you to the people who've come down. Uh, because uh, I, I was just talking about this to Stuart Goldsmith. I don't get any of the money from that Kickstarter. He thought I was insane. All of the money goes into, into making it. But I do get some of the money from you people who've paid. So thanks to the ten people who've paid to come and... <laughs> See the show that will buy one nappy for my child, uh, and it's uh, lo lots of things have happened in between these two series. Even though we finished recording uh, quite ish, uh, quite recently, I mean the big the thing the show is slightly ruined by the David Cameron pick sex. <laughs> it sort of slightly ruined the emergency questions just because now anything I ask is not as good as that. Is that is not as, that would be a brilliant emergency question? Have you ever fucked the dead head of a pig? <laughs> It'd be one that wouldn't pay off for it, but then when David Cameron's on, he'd go, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I did. Thinking about it, I did do that. He probably didn't do it. I, it's annoying. I mean, you, you want him to do it, so that makes it true. But the bigger story, it annoys me, this story. We might talk about it more later, because uh, it's incredibly not topical to the people at home. Uh, it's going out quite some time down the line. But uh, it's, it, the Ashcroft is a much, much worse person than David Cameron. A lot worse. A is, if, he, if, he was, if it's true, he had the confidence of David Cameron, he's betrayed it. Uh, B, if it isn't true, he's made it up. Uh, but also, he controls the government, and that's what... You're all so obsessed with the man fucking their pig skull, and it's hard not to be, <laughs> that you're not thinking, hold on, so there's a man who pays money to make the government go, and if he doesn't like the government, then he just says something about them and they're no longer the government. That's a bit scary, I would say. So anyway, I've... Uh, and uh, CJ from Eggheads has killed a man in the interim of this. <laughs> which I'd known that when I was talking to Paul Sinner, that would have changed the... Well, a bit like uh, Ashcroft, except CJ's doing it to himself. He says he's killed. He says he might have killed a man. He clearly hasn't done any of this. It's clearly a lie. Uh, Lord Sugar's autobiography is out. It's called Unscripted, which is ironic. Uh, and it's an ironic title, and it's not as good as Ass Poo Full of Sugar, is it? That is... 
Uh, and uh, oh, there's loads more coming. Oh, there, there, the whole Corbyn thing is very. I mean, again, we're talking about how Murray about in the last series about uh, the need to change the political system, and then Corbyn's come in and sort of trying to do that from the perspective. Uh, it's a slightly reactionary way, I would say, to go back to the 1980s. But it's very exciting. Uh, he didn't sing "God Save the Queen." Uh, which people, some people pretended to be very furious about. I generally, nobody actually cares about that. that is, I'm so angry the man didn't sing the horrible song. It's a terrible song, right, isn't it? It's not about being British. It's about an, a fictional character looking after a woman who is the most heavily protected woman on the planet. <laughs> It's unnecessary. And if you think about it, God Save the Queen implies, you know, that, uh, that, that, that people want the Queen to be put in some kind of peril, doesn't it? To, to need to be safe. Uh, God must be, if there is a God, he must be furious about being constant. I think we have to change God Save the Queen to a, a national anthem about being what, what's cool about being British. Which, you know, it's not much. It'd be difficult. I thought maybe the laughing policeman would be a good compromise. <laughs> We'd enjoy singing that. The only good bit in God Save the Queen is, na 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 na. That's the only good bit in it. <laughs> That's the only bit we enjoy doing, and you're not meant to sing to that bit. And that's the bit. That's the only good bit. Anyway, there's been so, and the robot sex thing has, has, has become a big story, mainly because of because of me. Uh, so uh, because of my obsession with it. Anyway, look, we're going to crack straight on. Uh, my first guest of the series, he's come over from another podcast. It's going to confuse some people. How has he managed to get through the, the podcast door? He is probably best known though as Caleb in CBBC's. <laughs> Mission colon 2110. That's probably what he's best known for. It's Stuart Goldsmith, ladies and gentlemen. Stuart Goldsmith, come in. Stuart. Sit down. Welcome. Thank you. Sit down. Pull up a microphone. Oh, that, uh, that co no one ever pronounces the colon out loud. And <laughs> no. I, I have to say, it improves the title <laughs> of the show. Given that it was a children's television programme, Mission, Mission Colon. Mission Sounds like much more the sort of show you'd like to make. Yeah, it was, that's right. <laughs> so what was, what was all about, Caleb? That's what people have come to see to hear yeah. talk about. So we've got an hour, so let's... Yeah, let's get, let's get stuck in. <laughs> uh, Mission 2110 was a, uh, a show that uh, was for children, and it was a cross between... Uh, the, it was like the Crystal Maze and the meets Terminator for children, where I, uh, a cyborg and also the last human being alive. <laughs> now, some of you nerds will be going, yes. And <laughs> as was I, <laughs> it was my dream job on every level. Um, I, uh, I lived in the future and, uh, and I had to teleport children into the future. Right. <laughs> Just made by the BBC. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. That saves them, doesn't it, from any inquiries. As long as it happens in the future. It's no good in the past. We can get them to the future, no one and, can touch us. And there were... There were some robots. Now, it was not made explicit at any point that they were sex robots, <laughs> but they may have been, given yeah. the, uh, the content of the show. Yes, I, I teleported children into the future in order to help me, uh, in order that they help me. I never lifted a finger. Uh, they had to solve a variety of challenges in order to stop robots taking over the world. But the problem was, the robots were nine foot tall, incredible looking uh, things with people in them. Yeah. Little carny street performer friends of mine um, <laughs> that they were inside. And, uh, and they were so dangerous and unwieldy and heavy that none of the children were allowed anywhere near them. So it was as if they were like, right, kids, you're in the future. Oh, there's lasers. Oh, there's robots. Quick, stand away from the robots and do a word search. And they were going, mm, okay. It was amazing. I loved it. I loved it completely. You've done some acting. There's, you've got two entries on IMDb, which makes it confusing. I thought there was another Stuart Goldsmith, but this is you as well. You played Policeman 2 in Coming of Age. Who could forget <laughs> Policeman 2 in, and what was it again? Coming, of, coming <laughs> yeah. of Age, which was like a sort of sub two pints of lager and a packet of crisps. I was thinking it might have been two yes. or three down it for was, kids though, wasn't it? It was for yeah, like it was for, it was for, there's those kids again. Yeah. No, it was, uh, it, it was uh, yeah, it was two pints of lager written by someone who had kind of written, they'd kind of come on and sort of, I think they'd like, I'm not saying they'd won a competition. They like, you know, they. It was like, yeah, it was a youth-oriented yeah. version of it, and they yeah. were they were lovely kids. And I did the TV warm-up for that show, oh, and eventually, I think they took pity on me <laughs> as I was scratching on the door. Can I be on the program? Went, yes, you can be a policeman. Oh, can I be policeman one? <laughs> no. Yeah. I played probably policeman two on Anton Deck Unzipped. Me and Stuart Lee were policemen on. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Well, because they came on our show with when they were Anton Deck. Is that right? No, when they were PJ and Duncan. Yes. Uh, I think they wanted to be called They Ant were Deck. still Anton Deck at the time. Well, they were, they were still Anton Deck, but they wanted to be called Anton Deck, but everyone called him PJ and Duncan. Uh, yeah. They've managed to escape that, which is, they've done very, pretty well, but I, 
I'm going to carry on calling them PJ and <laughs> uh, And, uh, and yes, yeah, so they did our show, and then so we, we did their show. As nice. In, as in return. Uh, you can see it on YouTube, I think, if you check out. And you also played Survivor 2 uh, on the March if Inest it ain't Disaster. Broke, don't fix it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, it was the March Inest Disaster, yeah, which is a, a shame not to give them a name in that. You know, <laughs> true. You could be Survivor 2, so it seems a bit I clear. have never seen the tele, the tele... I feel like calling it a teleplay. It's a sort of... Dramumentary? Is that a thing? <laughs> a docu-tragedy. Doc. Well, so, uh, and it was about the March Ness disaster, yeah. a horrible disaster on the Thames when uh, a, some sort of boat died. You should know. You're well, no. a survivor too. You well, should know what it is. My entire role on the show was I had to climb out of the Thames yeah. onto the bank of the Thames at three o'clock in the morning once for 30 seconds. Right, okay. And that was my role. Survivor 2. Survivor. I did rather better than Survivor 3. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what there were that many survivors. Let's not, uh, let's not dwell on. <laughs> let's not dwell. So far, it's been future pedos <laughs> and people dying in a real disaster. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you, look, you've, you, you've obviously uh, not best known for the Comedians Comedian podcast that has been nominated for the Chortle Award on several occasions. <laughs> yeah, but always picked at the post <laughs> and always by you. No, not, no, not, not by this you. Year, this year. Last year, picked at the post by someone else, by the yeah, QI, QI podcast. podcast. I lost my crown for the first time. I was the yeah. only winner of it four years in a row. I wish, I wi I'm sure you think the same. I wish I'd thought to have the name of a nationally recognised amazing <laughs> television programme in the title of my show yeah. and to be tied to that programme across all media. <laughs> yeah. That sounded bitter, but I love them. They're lovely <laughs> And in fact, on the night when I, I looked, because I turned up to the awards late, uh, which is the best way to do it, because I didn't know who'd been nominated or anything. I just turned up and had a nice drink with everyone. And obviously part of that nice drink was me going, anyone got any news for me? No, 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 no it's fine. But uh, I met all the, the lovely QI uh, elves, as they're called, and they're lovely people. And uh, one of them came over and said, oh, I, I want to introduce you to the other ones because they really want to meet you because they, they love your podcast, but they're embarrassed to meet you. So I was like, that is the real prize. <laughs> I voted for you. Thanks, I, man. I, I, a, I didn't want to win because I felt it was embarrassing that I kept winning. Yes. It kind of gave the impression. There's I would love good. to have that problem. It kind of gives the impression there's nothing good on the internet. That's, it's like, well done. <laughs> We've given it to the only podcast there is. Again. Yes. So it's nice that someone else. But I did vote. I mean, you voted for me, and you were you were uh, you were public about the fact oh, you voted for me, which I appreciated. And yeah. you said a very nice thing to me just before did you came on. Would you like to repeat it? No, I can't remember what it was. You said it for your. Oh no, it's exclusive content for your <laughs> people with badges. People, no, it's my. Well, it's the only podcast that I listen to all the time. Thanks Although, uh, but I do listen to it when I'm in the gym, uh, and so I haven't, <laughs> I haven't heard it recently. Uh, but uh, should I start? Should I do that? Should we have an inter podcast thing where I go, "Go on, Richard! Go on, <laughs> you Richard! Can, you, can, you can run! You can do! It. You can when do!" I started, it. When I last time I was going to the gym, I was trying to do a thing where I did a, a, an exercise to pointless. If I was on the exercise bike, I had to watch the entire episode of Pointless and be on. I'm, I'm beyond That's the exercise bike for that time. It's a very good idea for a, a workout. If you enjoy it, you know, it doesn't have to be pointless, but if it isn't, you're an idiot. Uh, and, if, you know, you can actually, I, and if I do it at home, I can play along on my phone as well as I'm, as I'm doing Whilst it. you're on the exercise yeah. bike. And That's a good idea. TV and it's a bit harder than just for different reasons on the uh, gym bike. So let's not get into it. Uh, but uh, it's, you've, been, you've done 141 Comedians, Comedian Podcast. Yeah, I have released 141, yeah. and I've got an, another 20 clogging up my hard drive and life. Wow. So, yeah, I've done quite a lot of them. Because we've done, this is our 82nd official one. I think we've done 85. Amateur. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I've, I've, done, I've suddenly realised I'm not doing enough podcasts. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to release some more. Yeah, I, I've, uh, done a, I've done a load of them. I've just got back from L.A., from the, from the L.A. Podcast Festival. And are they all different people? So, are they all different people that you... Uh, yes, they are. Um, Brendan Burns has done two of them, and Sarah Millican has done two of them. Uh, in both cases, to settle a score. Uh, no, Brendan, obviously. Not <laughs> um, And, uh, yeah, so they're all, all different people. Yeah. And so uh, tell us about... I did want to talk about it, because I saw you tweeting about the LA Podcast Festival. So what is... Yeah. What, I'd never... No one asked me to go to it. No, so nor me. I gay crashed okay. the fucker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just turned up. I turned up. Uh, and uh, yeah, so LA Podfest is the thing, and it's, uh, I don't know if it's the first one, but it's been going for about four years, and it's a bunch of Americans getting together with a bunch of other Americans and going, who's this English guy? And why has he hastily uh, photocopied some flyers and is <laughs> handing them out to our audience? <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I did that, it was amazing, yeah. really exciting. Um, and you did quite a few out there with American comedians. Yeah, I, I interviewed uh, Jimmy Pardo, uh, who's a brilliant comic and used to open for Conan O'Brien, and I interviewed Todd Glass, who famously uh, came out of the closet on the, the WTF podcast oh, yeah. uh, three years ago. 
and, um, and also Jackie Cation, who does a super nerdy one called The, the Dork Forest, and also Dave Anthony, who, uh, who is one of the people that runs the festival. Don't know any of them, they all sound rubbish. So, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, had, uh, I had Stephen Fry on this thing, you know. Yeah, uh, you did, you know what? I've always, I wanted to say this, but that, the best question asked on this show was what's it like being Stephen it Fry? Was. That's the question we want to know. That what's it like being you is all I want to ask on my show. And it wasn't even your question, <laughs> it, it was a child. And everyone went, what a stupid question. And then Stephen Fry went, I nearly killed myself. And went, oh, follow the child. <laughs> it's such a good question. That's the only yeah. thing we care about, isn't it? What's it like being you? Yeah. And he gave a brilliant answer to it. it well, great. your show is, one, you're basically one of my emergency questions is your show is where do you get your crazy ideas from? That's basically, that's basically what your podcast is. You've taken that and turned it into a whole podcast. Yes. Where do and you well, get what, your crazy ideas I, I from? I have the reverse you? thing. My emergency question is, uh, who are you most jealous of? Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> who are you most jealous of? Uh, you. Oh, yeah, um, no, I, that's a good question. I don't know. It who is a good question. Who am I, it's well, your I'm, own question. I'd better ask other people's questions. Yeah, I'm. I'm the the problem with my life and career, and also probably why my show's quite good, is that I'm jealous of everyone. If I see a comic do well, I'll go. I should be doing more like this. I should be doing. I saw. I was gig with Mark Watson last night. I was like, oh, I should be. I should be more kind of sort of fluid and stuff. And then I'll work with a one-liner guy, and I'll go. Oh, I should. I should write one-liners more. And so I'm jealous of absolutely everybody. But you're so. surely you're one of the nicest people, in, the nicest comedians. You're very, in your, you're very supportive of all the people you have on. You're, you always love what they do, generally. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, you absolutely. are, you're not, you don't come across as an envious type. I think you're kind of, you seem to be interested. I think what you're very good as an interviewer, and I'm occasionally good at this, but usually not, because I enjoy the sound of my own voice too, too much, <laughs> is, to, is to just, when you interviewed me, the best thing you did is just, you ask a question, and then go very quiet for a long time, yes. knowing that any comedian, if they just get to the end of a sentence, will go, oh, no one's talking, I'd better carry on. And then, yes. so they end up adding more stuff. Yes, Louisa Omulan called me on it, though. Because right. <laughs> there was a bit when I interviewed her, when I, she said something like, oh, because of this, because my dad was so angry, and I kind of, with my hand, and I'll need to explain what I'm doing for the <laughs> listeners, I, I kind of went, uh, a gesture that means... Go on. And she went, fuck you, Stuart Goldsmith. Hey, everyone. He's just gone like, go on, tell me all your stuff. I was like, oh, shit, I shouldn't have done that. Um, yes, but I, well, that's what I've been saying to everyone in LA is my, my, what I do for my show. The USP, if you like, the unique selling point is that I try and ask interesting, challenging, and well-researched questions. And then I shut up and listen to the answers yeah, uniquely. Nice. Don't do that. <laughs> no, exactly. no, I want to just ask the question. But, but then I, I'm off the hook because my show yeah. isn't a comedy show. It's a show about comedy. So I don't, I don't have any onus to be funny. It, well, it's very, you know, I think as a comedian, it's very interesting to hear uh, uh, other comedians uh, talking about how they do what they do. And, yes. Uh, I mean, because I'm, I'm a big comedy fan as well. I think this is why I like this show, because it does, it does very, qu you very quickly get under the skin of, of people. And you, you yeah. have Matt Lucas, I was just listening to the Matt Lucas one, which mm. is one of the most recent ones. Uh, and he's very open, very quickly. Yes, I, uh, yeah, I'm nice, I think. Yeah. It's difficult to say I'm nice, because people immediately listen and go, no, it's not what a nice person would say. <laughs> but I care. I really give a fuck. I really, really care. And I really am on the side of the person I'm interviewing. Yeah. And I really want them to give the best of themselves. And I also, I'm just quite empathic. And I think because I'm quite an anxious person, and I do a lot of negative thinking to myself, I'm quite good at spotting it in other people. So when people have a preconception, they go, well, I'm like this. I like going, but are you like that? Because I think you're just telling yourself you're like that because of this, this, and this. So it's sort of like a bit, like it's a bit like an untrained man doing <laughs> therapy with, uh, with no regard for the consequences. <laughs> So, uh, no, anyway, let's, we'll, we'll qu quickly tell people about what you did before, uh, and then we'll see where we go. We'll t I, mean, I want to talk to you about David Cameron having sex with a pig, mainly, but we'll get to that, that If we're cutting to the emergency questions, yeah. then my, I've already got the answer to this. That fucking dead pig skull was asking for it. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> uh, you started, you did start as a street performer, is that, so you would, but you did, you trained as an actor. Is no, right? it, it's all or a bit it, yeah. convoluted. When I was 16, I did a street show for the first time because uh, I saw someone walking on broken glass and me and my mate Noel went, oh, I reckon I know we could do that. Like, as a, as a sort of fakir stunt. Yeah. And we, uh, we were right. We went home and tried it. Do not try it at home like we did. 
um, unless you've, you really think you know how it's done. <laughs> uh, and we thought we did, and we did, and I could juggle, so we threw together a street show, and we went out and made some money and went, oh, fucking hell, we don't need to get real jobs. <laughs> and, uh, and then I went to circus school for a year. Right. And that is exactly as you expected. <laughs> <laughs> if you're expecting, like eight very tall Norwegians who are good at everything and look good in leggings, and you are an 18-year-old boy from Leamington Spa. <laughs> That's largely what you can expect from that experience. Um, and uh, so I came out and did street shows, and then I did like a theatre devising degree, and during the summer I would go up to the Edinburgh Fe uh, Festival, and where I would see you, because I've been going for 20 years now, so I've seen most of your shows from up there. Um, and, uh, and I would go, yeah, do street shows uh, during the summers, and then I became a full-time street performer, and then I was briefly a, a bad actor. And then I went back to street performing, <laughs> and then I discovered comedy. Okay. And you've been... You, you, in 2012, we had a similar thing. Uh, we got, both got into trouble in the Fringe <laughs> programme. Yes, we Because your, story was, your show was called Prick. Yes. Which I thought was very bad it's that they censored that, because that means it has so many different Yeah, meanings. prick in itself isn't a, no. a rude word. No. I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe that they censored it. And I, I remember thinking, ooh, this, this is like the first whiff of some publicity. I might sell some tickets. And then I looked on Chortle uh, the next day, and it said, Richard Herring outraged that the word, <laughs> that Stu can't use the word prick. And I went, oh, I've learned how the world works. <laughs> that was very, very smart. Well, I did talk, you know, I was doing Talking Cock, which I'd done before in Edinburgh. Yeah. I never had any problem with it. And again, talk, cock has lots of different meanings. So it does, it not, it would seem very weird that, I don't know if this is still carried on beyond that year. because I don't think there was sufficient no. outcry that they were quite embarrassed and retracted. It seems but very weird that the Fringe programme would start censoring it, but it was just ridiculous to, yes. without there was knowing what, because you could, you know, you could have been someone who burst balloons or something. I mean, you would be a prick, but yeah. that could be <laughs> bursting exclusively <laughs> other children's balloons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, which reminds me, incidentally, yeah. my favourite ever, you mentioned street shows, my favourite ever joke anyone ever did on the street, and the, the, this guy used to do it in Covent Garden, a stone's throw from this auditorium, yeah. uh, a street performer called Pepe, who was the best that ever worked, I think he was yeah. amazing, and his best joke was, uh, he, or my favourite of his jokes was he had a huge, huge crowd, like he looked like a really dirty, shabby clown, and was. <laughs> and, um, and he'd find the cutest, cutest little kid, like a little three-year-old kid, and, and he'd beckon them, and they'd walk out, this big crowd watching, they'd walk out on their own, and he'd blow them a balloon dog, and then when they got about a metre away, he'd beckon them up and they'd get slightly closer and he'd put it on the floor, stamp on it and give them the finger. And it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was just outrage, wall-to-wall -wall outrage. And that's what I loved about the street. I loved that it. it was so, it could be so provocative and challenging. Yeah. And then when you then go to Edinburgh and you see comedians do stuff which is, in inverted commas, provocative and challenging, part of me thinks, come off it, mate. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Did you ever work with Rumpel? Who, um, I know Rumpel very yeah. well. I never worked with him, but no. I saw Rumpel. Did you know? Have you, has he been we on the did, show? He did uh, the Edinburgh Fringe. I don't think I could do a whole uh, <laughs> less than <laughs> Do you know who Rumpel is? Are you up to speed on Rumpel? If you, if you haven't, go to, the, the, I think it's the first series of the Edinburgh Fringe podcast. I OK. Was, I think he was one of the final guests, and then maybe the second series. But Phil Nicol had recommended him as a guest. Good God. I think but, we okay. had him on twice. I can't remember. It feels... Feels like I had him on twice. Imagine, times, yeah. imagine uh, the guy Timothy Claypole from Rent a Ghost, yeah. right? But insane and never out of character. <laughs> and he would do regularly. He'd regularly do like thirty-six hour shows. And he, I remember, yeah. I saw him in Adelaide doing street shows in Adelaide in something like two thousand and two. Uh, and he'd be bouncing up and down. He'd be on a unicycle, but he wouldn't ride it anywhere. He'd just bounce on it while swinging a hand, a toy hand, on a bit of string. And he would do the shows from two in the morning when all the regular street performers stopped. He'd do the shows from two in the morning until six in the morning when the sprinkler system heckled him <laughs> off, the, uh, off the park. <laughs> and he'd be bouncing up and down going, I've just got to break even on my nine volt battery. <laughs> and he would always talk like that and wore a prosthetic nose which he never took off. Yeah. Horrifying. It was very, very interesting talking to him. <laughs> uh, <so. laughs> well, that's the other side. That's the great thing about street theatre yeah. is that anyone can do it, yeah. and that's the prize of it, and it's also the consequence. Cool. We're going to try out some uh, new emergency questions. And I've, I've, I feel I have to leave the old ones behind. Uh, have you ever put your genitals in the mouth of a dead animal? <laughs> I don't think I can. Don't think so. No. It's good you thought about it. Have you ever put your genitals in the mouth of a living animal? <laughs> and which would be worse? 
Oh, that's the question. Which would be worse? That's an interesting thing. Uh, no, on either occasion. Yeah. Um, although I did, I remember I had a friend uh, when I was about 14, a girl who said that she used to get her dog to... Um, yeah, I'm sure, a lot, I'm sure many people out there are hypocrites, because I'm sure many people have done that. Well, done what, mate? Well, oh. put like... I, I used to put Marmite on my finger, my cat used to lick it, and I'm sure someone's thought, hmm... S someone, bitch? <laughs> I didn't think... I, I, think, I think I had a conversation with David Baddiel about this, but... Am I right? I don't know. Maybe it might have been not on, uh, not on the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what? In a, in a ring of yours? In some but sort it, of you ring? Know, a cat has a very bumpy tongue. So if you're into it, it's got like little, it's kind of got, you know, I can, that's, it's a lot. What is a pig? has sharp, vicious teeth in there. Yes. You know, so that's, even if it's dead... No, but, but morally, uh, sort of ethically speaking, yeah. is it better to put your junk in the mouth of a, a dead pig or a live I think pig? they're both quite bad. <laughs> yeah, they are both bad. Yeah, they're both quite... I think, you know, if you want to keep your genitals, make sure the pig's dead. Yeah, I, I think, would say. I think, ethically speaking, it's all right to do it to a dead pig, provided you then eat the pig. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If you're getting the most... I mean, otherwise it's like you're throwing away a load of yeah. usable pig cocks. I think it's disrespectful. I think the pig has died of natural causes. It's okay to do it. But if you've murdered the pig in order to put your cock With in your cock. <laughs> yeah. you like, the, you've suffocated it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's wrong. <laughs> what, is, what is worse, bestiality or necrophilia? This is my new... <laughs> what is worse? Um, that remark... Well, when... When I was a teenager, me and my housemates used to play uh, a video game called uh, Super Bomberman. You might know it. You, you, you run around a oh, maze yes. and you let bombs and they blow to that. And uh, whenever my friend Spencer Cummins killed, whenever his Bomberman killed my Bomberman, he would, your, your dead one would flash on the screen for a couple of seconds, giving yeah. him just enough time to get up and run past it back and forth, <laughs> making with, this, with his mouth making this noise. <laughs> which he suggested was him wanking into the corpse of my Bomberman yeah. in a move that he called an oral necromastomentality. <laughs> <laughs> so, in answer to your question, yeah. what's worse? Ne well, did you kill the... Are we talking well, about... I'm talking living, bestiality with a living animal. Um, or I would say... I would with, say for... Or bestiality with a dead person, is that the question? Uh, no, bestiality... Necro best, you can't have... Sorry, sorry, with necrophilia with a necrophilia dead human. or animal, I don't care. Well, I think you've made your There's position no very clear. <laughs> <laughs> no difference if the thing's dead. That's what. Yeah, um, I, think, yeah, yeah. If, I think it's worse. The, 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 anything where the thing is alive and unconsenting is yeah. definitely worse. Yeah. yeah. Can an animal consent, though? <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is a big question because there are zoophiles who believe that uh, animals yes, can consent. Because animals want to. If, yeah. it, if it backs onto you, is that the argument? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I was researching my book, Talking Cock. <laughs> I came across a website about a man who was a zoophile website and he claimed you could have sex. He had, there were dolphins that wanted, that would come up to him in order. Yeah, to I mean, is it, wor is it worse if a dolphin tries to shag you and you turn it down? Yeah. Is that worse than, than if it. No? <laughs> Everyone's got very quiet. I, I mean, if it, like a dog humps your leg, right? Yeah. And like that wants to. It's, that's, that's consent, isn't it? Well, it's, no, the dog, like, is, if you the dog let... is raping you. Like, that's what's happening. You're, unless you've given the dog consent to do Yes. That. And if you can, can you consent to a dog? If you no. say to a dog, this is fine with me, does it lose interest? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not really what I was in it for. Me. So, you know, it's a big question. It's a difficult question. Uh, so, here's my, another emergency question I've got for you. Why can't everyone be babies? That is my new emergency. <laughs> oh, yeah. on the subject of babies, I've, yeah. got, I've got a present for your Have baby. You? Oh, I've got a present nice. for your little child. Oh, thank you. Like I open it it's, now. A good, it's a good present. It's going to explode. I don't know baby. if you'd like to say the name of your, your child. My child's called Phoebe. She's, loved, she's still alive, which is an, an that amazing That is a major achievement. achievement. Well is. done. And I know you're having a, a baby. It's a, it's a bib. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bib. The bib and says, the comedian's comedian with Stuart Goldsmith. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it'd be nice. It's like a function. Like, you can't get those in the shops. <laughs> That's a, it's not merch, that's a one-off item. Nice. I'll, I will get a one for your child. And <laughs> you, Stuart, we'll talk about this later, but you live very close to me, so I can, I can post one round to you. Yes, uh, I am. About with, uh, my partner is pregnant. I know, We're having yeah. a baby soon. I know, I'm very excited about Thanks, it. Thanks, man. Please do me one of those with your... With your <laughs> <husband> <laughs> well, I definitely will. Why can't everyone be babies, though? Wouldn't it be good? 
It would if everyone just became a baby. I'm not saying like what everyone immediately with yeah. all the existing infrastructure yeah. suddenly became just a baby. everyone became a baby. I think it'd be great. Yeah. I mean, it'd be carnage, wouldn't it? Well, there'd be like one evil king baby who's yeah. bigger and tougher and smashed think, all the other babies. I think everyone would die quite quickly. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> but you know, uh, it'd be cool for a bit, and it would save the world because yeah. all the people would die, yeah. all the babies would. All the if they all died, die. none of them grew. Do you think if everyone became a baby immediately now, what I imagine is an alien gives a, finds a crystal. Some Buddhist monks find an alien crystal. This is the last they, chapter of they, any Stephen King novel. They touch God. it and then everyone turns into a baby. Yeah. Uh, it would be a good movie, wouldn't it? That would, you'd watch that movie. And yes. then uh, it's difficult I'm, I'm to sort of cast. It. Uh, Can you imagine the baby that would play the Rock? If he was like the hero, <laughs> Dwayne Johnson, the baby version of him, <laughs> just just all chin. <laughs> I suggested this on Twitter the other day, and everyone was going, "But you know, where, what would this, what, what would, how would uh, people do this?" And I'd go, "It wouldn't matter. There'd be babies. It's basically the answer to everything. So they wouldn't do that. Be, where would buildings come from? It wouldn't matter. There'd be babies. There'd be babies." Yeah. Be. So what you're imagining is actually an apocalyptic event, yeah. whereby rather than like lava or a meteor, everyone turns into everyone babies turns and, into then, baby. and then dies after a few but, hours. Like babies are really funny, right? They, I, I got I got this idea because I was watching my daughter asleep, and um, I've got like a camera set up to watch her. It's not creepy. You're meant to do it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, and uh, you just, and David Baddiel with your cameras. <laughs> you're just moving around like that. I thought it would be nice if everyone was a baby. It would just be much better. Yeah, because they don't be they I don't have babies. any judge. There's no judgment. No. My daughter is friendly with everyone. No, like a lot of people, I don't want her to be friendly with. <laughs> would uh, could you could be, could we all be babies except each one of us has a sort of Baymax esque care robot that looks after us. So everyone is babies, but we are kept could alive. Do. Yeah. Like a little sort of inflatable. But do we then stay being babies or do the do we Oh yeah. Do we grow up and become adults from that or do we stay being babies? I think stay. Yeah. Because otherwise it's just a bit of a it's a, it's a, it's a series reboot <laughs> of the world, <laughs> isn't it? Okay. okay. Not that hasn't been successful in the emergency question. <laughs> I think it's a good question. Maybe okay. I didn't give you the best. This is, I'm just I'll try a few I'm trying them out. I'm sort of just seeing this very much as a practice one before I go on to the proper guests. <laughs> so just, you just know, to get me the, back the in. The sad part is I'm <laughs> fine with that. <laughs> what, this is my, my favourite emergency question I've ever come up with. What is the worst emergency you've ever been involved in? <laughs> it's a great emergency question because it works on two levels. Yeah. <laughs> The worst emergency. Apart from the March and Esther disaster, which I'm not counting because that's. No, it doesn't. I was a reenact. Yeah. <laughs> What's the worst emergency <laughs> you've ever reenacted? It's a, it's a slightly <laughs> different flavour of question. The worst emergency? God. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I was in a pub that got hit by a car. Wow, that's pretty good. I mean, that's just not a thing, is it? But it was. It happened. I was in a pub. I was in the Montague Arms. Do you know it? In South East London. Yeah. Ludicrous pub where they've got like stuffed zebra pulling a rickshaw yeah. and crocodiles and stuff. And I was in, and a, a, a car came skidding around the corner, slammed into the side of the pub, and then drove off. Wow. And it's obviously been nicked or something. And I'm quite good in a crisis. So I immediately, like everyone else, was like, what's on? And I was outside writing down the reg on my hand wow. in Byron. Um, but I didn't really, I wasn't involved. Did in they it. capture the men? Who did I don't know. Or I went back inside and had a macaroni and cheese. Okay. <laughs> good, that was a good, <laughs> that, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have got that question, now, would we? I think that, for me, I think I was, uh, when I was in, I did some Camp America when I was uh, 18. Okay. You know, where you go to summer camps in America and, and they don't pay you, but you work there for ages. Yes, yep. Uh, and on the, and this is, on the line, we're in the Redwood Forest in, in Northern California. Mm. Which in a lot of ways was amazing, because but but we, we we were it was an unusual summer camp, and most of them were for very rich kids, and this was for all the poor kids from San Francisco and um, and uh, yeah and uh, what's it called? I should know because it's all in like, the Ice T songs. I can't remember the name of the other yeah. really rough area in San Francisco. But uh, on the last night when all the kids had gone home, thankfully we had a massive party, and then that someone the one of the cabins went was on fire, oh, and we were two hundred miles away from the nearest fire station, and all the trees were going up on fire and stuff. Wow, it's quite, I think I died, and uh, the, <laughs> the rest of my life has been a weirdly unhappy. I mean, it's dream. certainly it's certainly a great question for teeing up your own anecdote. It is. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think I've ever told it. I don't think I've told anyone. I was just wondering what my answer was. This is the first yeah. time I've asked. No, it's a it's a good question. I mean, I was in a very serious car accident when Were I was you? a kid, but I, well, I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem with that question. This should usually be yes. I was in 9/11 and all. My, yeah, well, the, my that, family were all killed. That comedian, there, isn't there a comedian yeah. in the States who claimed he was in 9-11 yeah. and he's just had to come out and go, no, I was, uh, I, was, I was young and I was getting interviewed and uh, I just claimed I was in 9-11. <laughs> that's, 
Knowing your right to be horrified. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Well, there's two people. Because also the woman who was head of the survivors group from 9-11 yeah. turned out not to have been in 9-11. No way. I didn't so know it's that. like the kind of, But it's the kind of... You're going to make up a lie, you know. So if you want to get attention... Go big. Yeah. Just go go yeah, big. I was in 9-11. I think I might do it. I was I, in 9-11. I did 9-11. <laughs> I masterminded 9-11. <laughs> guys, guys. <laughs> I was in one of the planes in 9-11. Oh, yeah. I think this is the worst thing I've ever said on record or any kind of public recording. Okay. Uh, if you were a dead I pig... I absolutely didn't mastermind 9-11. Because <laughs> that is the sort of thing that you'll, they'll bang you up. <laughs> they will. I'll get snatched off the street in a van with all the windows... They were in one of those back if you have windows, done it, I think. you know, a I, greenhouse. I think they think, I think they think they've got the guy who did that one, but we'll see. Uh, if you were a dead pig, would you rather be eaten or orally raped by a future prime minister? <laughs> like it. I just hope to God it's still topical. Um, uh, I would rather be eaten. Would you? Yeah. It's a good story, though. I mean, like, what I like about the, in the end, it's a kind of revenge for the pig, isn't it? The pig had been killed yes. or was dead and then was, was treated very badly but in the end he may bring down the Yes, it's minister. like what happens if there was a film of the life of the pig and it was tragic and then it faded out and it was a black screen and then white credits came up yeah. and said actually in 2015 people found out and Cameron, the whole government fell apart yeah. don't fuck dead pigs <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> under any circumstances And then he just really. cuts to the pig's skull going <laughs> like, especially not if you're being groomed for power. Like, yeah. they must have known in the kind of that Bullingdon gang, they must have no. I mean, did they... It didn't happen. I was like, it's just, it didn't happen. Did it not happen? I don't think it happened. It's just, I mean, it's just I... so outrageous that there's no point. Like, he, it would be lowering Cameron further somehow to deny it, wouldn't it? So he can't there's, have an opinion. You can't so actually, you can it. feel free to say anything about yeah. anyone as long as it's incredibly outrageous. Well, what I genuinely find worrying about it is that people just said, well, A, a lot of people who went the week before going, oh, you can't say that about Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, no, we, we're, we're going to run with yeah. this one. Uh, so it's slightly hypocritical. But also, if you, if you can just say something about someone and it becomes true, that's not a nice world to live in. It, just because yes. you don't like the person. I agree. That just means we can say anything about anyone. Yeah. People said that I like to go to get girls to my hotel room, sit in a high-backed armchair <laughs> and masturbate as they dance. And I... But I you like that. You, you I've never done like, that. You would like to do that. I don't think do I that. would. It'd be a waste of getting a girl back to your hotel room. Okay. I can sit in a high back jail and show my any time I want. And just imagine. Uh, <laughs> imagine the rest of it. I mean, uh, I don't know how that story even got out into the public. <laughs> People started saying I was the king of Edinburgh. I was really embarrassed about uh, that now, as well. Now, that hang is, about, hang about. That you, is very didn't embarrassing. you say that you were the king of Edinburgh? I don't know where it started. I don't, you I said don't, it in an interview, I don't know where it began. and then you quoted it the next year, which I thought was brilliant. You said it about yourself. This is true, isn't it? You said it about yourself, and then you quote. You said it in like the Independent, whatever it was, uh, and then you you quoted it the next year as if they'd said it about you, which I thought was such a good idea. I stole the idea, and in the list, I was invited to interview. Uh, Arthur Smith, because Arthur Smith, several years ago, he said, uh, I'm, only being, I'm only letting critics into the show if they can juggle kippers. So the list got in touch with me and said, can you juggle kippers? And I went, yeah, probably. <laughs> so I juggled kippers and was allowed to review the show. And so I said that Arthur Smith was the, uh, he was the most, something like the, the most important and hilarious voice of his generation. And then I, and I signed it off, Stuart Goldsmith, the most important and hilarious voice of his generation, so that the next year I could quote it as the list. But I aimed, I aimed far too high. It's completely unfeasible, isn't it? It's totally unrealistic. Whereas King of Edinburgh is perfect. I don't, know where, I don't know how it started. It was you! Uh, it was uh, you! I find it very embarrassing, because I think, you know, there's no... The thing I like about Edinburgh, it's a meritocracy, and it's about... It's, 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 everyone's as important as each other, even the people who aren't as... Uh, you know, I mean... I, I mean, I kind of, you know, I, if there was a king, it would, should probably be me, but <laughs> there, there isn't, there isn't one. So, uh, I'll do one more emergency question, and I'll ask you some other questions. Kettle crisps are not as nice as they once were. <laughs> this is a rhetorical question, this first bit. <laughs> emergency <laughs> rhetorical <laughs> question. <laughs> Kettle crisps are not as nice as they once were. Have I changed, or have they? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question. I like it. That's a rhetorical question. Can I answer that? No. It's a rhetorical oh. question. Can I, can I make a rhetorical question that, is, that might reveal my answer? Yeah, go on then. Um, 
it, oh, I don't know how to phrase it now, it's confusing. <laughs> well, I would, no, I'm going to answer it, I'm going to answer it. I, I think that uh, both have happened. Yeah. I think they've probably changed the recipe. Yeah. And I think, I think you've changed, because you, like, you went all kind of diety and like, yeah. change your life yeah. didn't you? So probably you really, you're more, you're more uh, saturated I'm fats. Maybe. Taste differently. Uh, maybe science? I'm just used to more even classy, classier crisps than that now. Maybe that's what it that's is. That's a good point. They used to be a treat, didn't yeah. they? Whereas now, yeah. you're rolling in them. 60 yeah. grand's <laughs> worth of kettle <laughs> chips on Kickstarter. <laughs> nice. If you could travel back, and this is the question, if you could mm. travel back in time to compare any food of today <laughs> with an equivalent in the past, it comes in two parts. A, what time would you go back to? And B, what food would you taste? And C, whether it tastes the same. So it's, it's a time travel... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, might you sit back with your arms folded? It's a fucking good question, Richard. Um, uh, so it takes do a I... long time to come up with an emergency question as good as that. Do I have to compare? Have I got to think of a food from now? You can take a food now and take it back with you, and then you can eat the other. Well, you can do a taste version test. You can go, well, I'll have that. Let's see. For me, it might be a kettle crisps mm. or um, wagon wheels. I've always want, you know, want to know what whether the old they're the same like. size or not. Not just the new ones. Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know. I'm not really foody. I like a. I like a. I like a pad thai. Yeah. So I suppose I'd go back. A thousand years <laughs> and find out what pad ties were like. <laughs> sometimes the best questions don't get the best answers. That's what that's what it's just sometimes you can put a lot of work into a question. So you live I think um, it'd have a lot of lime in it. <laughs> <laughs> All nice. You live in uh, Shepherd's Bush near to me. In fact, I, I am house possibly backing onto my house. Uh, I live with Nish Kumar, and uh, Nish Kumar's house backs onto your yeah. flat perfectly. It back, like, well, I thought, when I moved into his place, I thought that you were on the same road, because I came round to your house when I interviewed you. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, I, I got the vague idea right, and I was like, I think, I, think, I think we're on the same street as Herring. And Nish was like, oh my God, incredible. <laughs> and, uh, and then I realised, because we looked through the, uh, the back through our back window, yeah. and we saw your wife walking around. <laughs> and we went, I mean, do they know people? Are, that's, that's your house. It literally does. Now, yeah. because it's been summer, the trees have all flourished, and we can't see each other oh, anymore. Oh but come the autumn, <laughs> come the fast approaching autumn. Because I walk around in, uh, in the kitchen, I walk around naked a lot. I walk around in my bedroom a lot. And every <laughs> single time I walk around in my bedroom naked, I think, I bet Herring thinks I'm showing my wang to him deliberately. <laughs> And I, I, I look, but I don't not walk around yeah. with my wang out. I just kind of do it in a slightly faster, yeah. which is sort okay. of worse because I'm it giving is. it extra sort yeah. of flick. <laughs> but I, I li I li it's insane to me that I used to watch you on television <laughs> when I was a teenager and, and me and my friend Emily would say egg like an egg to each other <laughs> over and over again. And, uh, and now I'm worrying about whether or not you can see my wang. <laughs> And not doing anything about it to hide my wang. That's wang like a wang. That, I mean, that's a, it's insane. It is. And you can can, have you seen us? You can, have you seen I haven't me or seen you. I don't know where you are, though, so I don't know which one. I Because I haven't seen you, so I don't know which window to look at. It's but directly I'm, out the back okay. and with a, with a first floor. So okay. we're not the basement floor. We're the, we're like the ground floor. the top floor of that house. The gutter's really hanging off very badly. Can't see should, it, mate. Can't should see have it. a word with them if they, they're... We used to Renting. talk about we used to Renting, talk about that. Couldn't give a fuck. We used to talk about that top floor window in the Collins and Herring podcast because we'd occasionally see, we'd occasionally drift into view. It's like it's sort of a bit like being in the a very slow version right. of the time machine, where everything's just moving yes, one second changes. ahead and you see someone moving around in their house. You're, so can you see it from all angles? Can you see it from like the top of the house? I can. Yeah, I could see. So you own yeah. the entire house. I own the entire house. Okay, no, <laughs> yeah, and uh, talking of which. It is not a cheap area, ladies and uh -huh. gentlemen. Uh, but Richard worked very hard on Time Gentlemen, please. Was a, it was 10, 10, 12 years ago. It was cheaper than it is now. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Are you going to leave this bit in? Yeah. <laughs> good, good for you. I'm trying to sell my house, in fact. And I still haven't sold it. And I've mentioned this last year, so you know how difficult it's proving. There's and a great view of my wang. <laughs> <that is>. <laughs> um, but the other... Well, during the last series... 
Uh, there was a mysterious egging of my house, which I blamed you on. I heard about it. Yeah. I, I didn't hear that episode, but I read on your blog on yeah. warming up um, that you blamed me for it. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's, a bit, it's, it's the biggest mystery since the cupboards in the Edinburgh Fringe flat. <laughs> uh, there's a certain... The obvious... That, the obvious... That, that reference really identified the super fans, <laughs> didn't it? Like, those six guys, they love it. The obvious candidate, uh, the obvious suspects, are the children who live next door to me. Yes. Um, and but then you know, in the, on all the trajectory would imply that there were six or seven eggs, and the next day I saw an empty egg box in their garden. Uh, so every do you not piece think of Richard, points to them. Do you not think that if I were to egg your house, <laughs> I would go to the trouble of leaving an empty egg box in I your neighbour's garden? You would. Garden. That's what I'm saying. It's too the clues it's are too, too neat. <laughs> it's too neat that there's an empty egg box in the garden as well. Well, so I I, th I realised it could be you as a as a revenge for the chortled humiliation. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot believe that I haven't primed my uh, whatever it is, 25? 25 of your fans. Rich, are in Richard here. gave me a discount code so that my fans could come in this and then used it to spy on how many people were coming to see me and bully me on Facebook. Only three, Stuart, keep pushing. <laughs> Well, I think we made it to 25 in the end, and I cannot believe I didn't think to prime them with eggs so that and, and my, I could drop a handkerchief and they could egg fuck out of you right now. And then, subsequently to that, uh, a, a human being did a massive shit in my front garden. That was me. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> No, the egg, the egg thing gave me the idea. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. I wish it was. I mean, no. we for ages, me, me and... I'm a good liar, though. Maybe this is all part of the act. Me and Nish were wondering how to break it to you that we could see into your house. Into several rooms of your house. I can see, I can see your wife writing. And uh, I can see your curtains. And, uh, and there's a wang. Um, but I, I, we were thinking, how do we tell him? Like, do we just... Tweet at him? Can we just like just tweet at Richard Hammond sixty seven? I can, see, him, I can see you <laughs> when you're like having a shit or something. We're like, how do you bring it up? But we would think there is no way to bring it up where we don't sound like the bad guys. But it's not deliberate. It's not like we're stalking you. It's just yeah. a preposterous coincidence. It is a very strange. You know, if a bomb hit Shepherd's Bush. The world of podcasting would carry would, on. Would <laughs> really, it really would open up for all those pretenders. It would open up for, you know, there'd be two more spaces for comedians interviewing other comedians. And let's face it, there isn't enough of that on the internet. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you ever made anyone in any of your interviews reveal that they wanted to kill themselves? <laughs> I think if you listen back to them, it's clear that several people want to kill themselves, but they're not explicit about it. No, 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 I, I haven't done that. But then neither, neither of you. It was a child. No, I haven't really. <laughs> I'm just the vessel. I'm the vessel. For the uh, child to ask a question. Yeah. Oh, so I, wonder, I wonder what that was for a second, and then I've worked out what it is. It just says, breathe fire, and I went, what? And then I'm, you can breathe fire. Is that what have you thought yeah, it was one of your notes to yourself? Breathe fire. this bit, breathe fire. <laughs> oh, God, I haven't done practice. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yes, I can breathe fire. I can't eat fire. That's quite difficult. That's the yeah. kind of sort of sinuous burlesque thing. But yeah. bre breathing or blowing fire is just putting a load of uh, carcinogenic fuel into your mouth <laughs> and then spraying it like in a way that it atomizes and you go Poof, like that and then you yeah. put a thing away. And then, yeah, I mean, don't do it. It's really bad for you. It cannot easily go wrong and it gives you cancer over a long time. Okay, I won't. I definitely won't do it. Uh, <laughs> And you were also in uh, Show Me the Funny in 2011. I don't remember, was I? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. I was. Hey, who remembers Show Me the Funny? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Ten million, they said. Ten million people are going to watch this. Three of them. <laughs> Three of them. Yeah, it was I... a sort of... Was it a, a sort of talent show of stand-ups, kind of, that with is, a bit more to it? That, no, 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 no more to that. it. No. Uh, they told us it was going to be like MasterChef for comedians. Right, yeah. It was not. In the end, it was yeah. It was like a talent. It was a, yeah. It was like a talent show for comedians. If instead of you seeing the comedians doing any stand up, the comedians had to go on stage and do some stand up they'd just written in front of the audience of people that it was written about. Like so, in Liverpool, it's an entirely female audience. They sort of changed it up. So you've got to write jokes for an entirely female audience of scousers, and you stress about it for three days, and then you go on and you do all these brand new jokes. You're not allowed to do any of your existing material and then you have a lovely gig, and then they, in the final programme, don't show any of the gig, uh, <laughs> instead focusing on Jason Manford in the... Uh, lovely Jason Manford, in the wings, looking at the camera going, Stu's having a great gig. 
<laughs> that's what it was like. It right. was it was intensely troubling and painful. I think I probably had the biggest problem with it out of anyone that was on it. Well, did you nearly walk off the show? Is that right? Or I oh I don't know where you, that I didn't realise that was public knowledge. No. Yeah, I I, no, I got it off the internet, so it's on there somewhere. All right. Um, I nearly did. Yes, when I realised what it was really about, I thought it was going to be like you're on a submarine. You know, make jokes about submarines to the submariners. And it, it was like, you're in Liverpool. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I found it very, very, uh, it just filled me with anxiety. It was so weird being on a show when you knew that the producers weren't on your side. Yeah. They, they weren't actively anti you, but they, it didn't matter if you did well or badly because it was all good telly. And, uh, and so I rang my brother and I said to my brother, listen, I, I think I'm gonna, I've had enough. I'm just doing my head in, I'm in tears every Wednesday. I can't cope, I'm gonna go home. Um, and my brother said, you can't quit. I was like, I can't, mate, I'll do what I want. He goes, no, you can't quit, I'll tell you why. Uh, he said, if you quit, they'll film you walking away and they'll play Coldplay over it. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't quit. <laughs> and, I, and I nearly made it to the final. And then weeks later, I did a gig and I said to someone, oh, months later, it had already gone out on telly, and I did a gig and I, I mentioned it briefly as part of something else. I was talking on stage, I mentioned, oh, I did this TV show. And someone came up to me in the audience, uh, some, from the audience came up to me in the interval, and they said, um, uh, were you, what telly program were you on? And I went, oh, it's called Show Me the Funny. It was like a sort of talent show thing here. Was that the one with Jason Manford? And I went, yeah. And he went, because I saw that. <laughs> in such a way as I was like, and he didn't recognise that I'd been on it for six yeah. episodes. So. The, the, the public are very fickle. The public are very yeah, fickle, and I have a generic face that I look like everyone's <laughs> brother's mate. So it's just difficult to remember me. Is, the, is that show where you've got, Alice Co there's, you've got an Alice Cooper quote on your website saying you were really funny? Uh, no, that was from, <laughs> no, that was from uh, a television warm-up job that I did for oh. a daytime television program okay. <laughs> called Loose Women. Oh, yes. <laughs> Fuck you, it paid my mortgage for three years. <laughs> During a, a rocky patch. Yeah, I, I was on Loose Women. Yeah. And they were all lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's got, that's a tough gig. Do you still do warm-ups or is that... Is Almost that... never. Yeah. I do, I, I still sometimes do the Graham Norton warm-up. Right. Which is marvellous. It's like, like the biggest TV studio in Europe and it's yeah. really fun to do. And sure. He's great and the show's great and it's brilliant. Um, but I don't really do any others anymore. Because it's a, it can be a bit of a trap for a comic because you, you they're very well paid, or yeah. it can be, but it's not the same as being a stand-up comedian. So you're sort of, you're, with a lot of them, you're sort of a member of the sound department. Like the, the director, the producer, they don't listen to the warm-up. Yeah. They, just, they just want the audience to be going, Wah! like that. And you don't need to be a good comedian to get that. You need to be good at getting people to do that. Yeah. So I don't really do them anymore. But I do, you know, if there's like friends, I, I quite like that some of my friends now, if they get a pilot made or something, they'll ask me and I'll do it because I'm, I'm quite yeah. good at them. But well, it's uh, nice when they match the person up with the show and sometimes they do that and sometimes they don't. So sometimes it feels like, oh, you'll go well with this audience and you'll be a good person to warm this audience up. But then sometimes, yes. sometimes you'll get entirely the wrong kind of comedian doing it. Or, or, yes, or the wrong and it can, it can really affect it. It can really affect uh, how a show works. Um, and it can, like, I've, I've, I did a... Yeah. I, I, did, I did one recently that went very badly and I don't want to talk about it. I, I, th <laughs> I think I've fucked someone's career. <laughs> but, it, but at the same time, like, being, like hosting a, a stand-up gig, it is important, you know, when the MC, their relationship with the room, that's yeah, important. Yeah. But at the same time, it's not as important as I think to myself that it is. Like, I, f I go out there going, oh, I've got the whole night on my shoulders. And you don't, really. you just got to get them facing the right way, and it's up to me. <laughs> so if this person's career is fucked, it wasn't me. <laughs> and are you happy? That is a question I think that you sort of asked. <laughs> well, uh, yes, I ask that of everyone. Josh yeah. Winnicombe is a big fan of my show and likes to text me his secret opinions about people I've had on the show. Right. <laughs> and now he's, it's become a running joke that whenever he sees me, he asks if I'm happy. <laughs> and that could be if he's just urinating next to me in a, in a public toilet. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> But he, he would definitely piss on me just for fun. No, he, uh, he, uh, he likes to ask me if I'm happy. Um, I am happier now than I have ever been. I've got a baby on the way. I've, uh, I'm engaged to be married to somebody brilliant. And well, you've done that the wrong way around. <laughs> yeah, I I, 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 we got engaged first, and then we just got... We just got Still is the wrong... You wish, wait no, until the I should have waited until day. it was all proper. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> until the wedding day. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm yes, really happy and I've had, uh, I've, I've been, I had sort of therapy in and on and off for a okay. long time and that's recently, that's really, really worked. 
and uh, the podcast, my podcast has given me, and your podcast has given me a lot of <laughs> <laughs> positivity as well. But the show and the fact that I'm connecting with humans and people write to me, people email me and say that my show has changed their lives quite often. Yeah. And in a way that constantly bewilders me and makes me feel really happy. Yeah, so, it's yeah. well, it's nice to have that, to, to you know, to have that connection with people. Well, it's, yeah. it's like when you get the, and the great thing about the internet is it's all over the world. I just love getting those yes. emails from Antarctica or yes. you know the middle of Africa or or Afghanistan. You know, where, where I wouldn't really necessarily be expecting people to be listening to this. It's, yes. a, it's a sort of bizarre feeling. It's a that. magical thing. Yeah. And we were talking before we came out about how podcast, this show, and this show for you, I'm sure, it's not a means to an end. It's the it's the end in itself. It's yeah. the thing. It's the thing, and it's it's better than telly, and it's better than radio in lots of different ways. Well, I think it is, and you know, I, th I think we were also just, in, in a way, TV. People always say to me, "Well, why don't you do this on TV?" And you kind of go, "Well, no one is asking me to do that. That is quite yeah. a big. That's quite a big part of the problem." <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I don't, you know, I don't think either of our shows would work as a TV show because the, it's the looseness of them. It's the fact that you can go anywhere with it. It's the fact you can spend an hour talking about something that you know yes. wouldn't necessarily be that interesting to yeah. There's the intimacy, the general uh, public. There's the know. intimacy of the connection, like the fact that it's audio and there will be people listening to this now in their baths. Stop yeah. it. Um, <laughs> and uh, and they're, and while they're running and you have a, and while they're driving and while they're getting on with other things and you're a really intimate voice in their ear and that's really special. But I, you could say that radio is like that, but the difference with, with podcasting is that you're the boss. And my podcast is the most successful thing that I've done in terms of the, the, the reaction that people have had about it and the emails from all over the world and the, you know, people being excited about it and very kindly donating to it and wanting it to continue. It's been really successful. And I have to think that's because I'm just doing it to please myself. I'm not doing it to impress anyone or to use it as a stepping stone to something else. I'm just doing it because I care how Richard Herring writes his jokes or how Pat Oswalt writes his jokes or whoever. I care. I really care and I want to know. And I get to spend as long as I like asking that person and presenting it as I want and having an actual conversation about it. And I, I don't think that... You, I'm not saying it, it could never work on TV in any format. Honestly, I'd love to work on TV. <laughs> but, um, but the way it is now and the, the pace and the engagement of it, no one would sit and, and watch that on TV for an hour and a half or for two hours. But I get to have those conversations for that long and people get to participate in them. You'd be surprised people watch this for an hour and a half, two hours, on, maybe on YouTube, but you know, it can, uh, so you'd be surprised. But yeah, it's, uh, no, it's, well, it's, and I also think TV and, and it's, it's, it's sort of blurring into, into like, obviously the BBC and ITV Channel 4 are kind of big, quite a big deal, but most TV shows are probably about the same level as the successful podcasts in terms of yes. listeners. And I would say not as, you know, the, you, uh, you have a very loyal audience, I think, as a... With your with your podcast and hopefully with my podcast, it seems absolutely, which is very which is is is, is very nice. Yeah, oh, good. Uh, and you won the Ham Fist Award, which you know it's just funny because of this show. So there we go. Uh, <laughs> we I'm not going to ask the question, but uh, you had to, the the worst review in Edinburgh. This I had year of was all the there's a, a website called FringePig.co.uk or .com which uh, reviews the reviewers at the Edinburgh Festival. It's very funny, and no one knows who writes it, and uh, uh, it's not me, but. Uh, uh, they awarded, there were several people who were nominated for the worst review and I, my, a review of my show won because it basically eulogised me and said this is incredible, he, even when he's standing still he produces so much energy <laughs> and that people can, even when he, things go wrong, what he says when it goes wrong is funnier than when it, oh my, it's the best thing I've ever seen, why doesn't he have his own TV show? <laughs> Three stars. <laughs> and uh, just, that was just funny, it just worked. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I won an award. And the award, although they didn't get round to doing this, what the award was supposed to be was £200 nailed to a pig's hoof, to a pig's trotter, I should say. Wow. Yeah. Magic. But I, I just got a pig mask because they didn't sort it out. It <laughs> Even that, that's kind of pathetic. <laughs> in a way. Well, I, I hope you have a lovely time with your baby. I, I'm going give, to give you lots of advice and sage advice. For yeah, please do. No, don't listen to any advice. That's the that's the only advice. People will give people will try to give you like advice, and it doesn't help because you know all of the babies are really different, yep. and our baby is just ridiculously good. So we, I, can't, I can't help yeah. you out with. We don't. Are you going to have another one? Oh well, I hope so. That's the trap everyone has. They have a golden baby, and they yeah. go, "This is easy," and then the second one's a bastard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we just we're reading a book at the moment. It's like the secrets of the baby whisperer or something, and yeah. it says there's there's five different types of baby. You can have a happy yeah. baby, a lazy baby, or a grumpy baby. I'm like, this, is that how we're... 
or uh, deciding, oh, I've got a shit one. <laughs> well, also, if you knew it was true, that, I've read that book. Well, I read some. My wife reads all of the books. Okay. And then says, you have to read all the books. And then I, they're on my bedside table. That's, uh, that's what we're I, doing. I, I said I, I've read the book. This is <laughs> that bit about the categories. That's what she told me. <laughs> but, but, you know, you have to read about every single type of baby. And what is easier is to wait and find what type of baby you've got. Yeah. And then work out on that other, rather than getting the information about all the things you have to do. Yes. Differently. I think it's good to have a book on standby in case something goes wrong and you're panicking and you don't yeah. know what to so do. You, you just can smack it over the head. The, <laughs> just kill it. <laughs> Bury it. Jam the book in the toaster. Leave the gas on. Get out. Um, <laughs> like I said, I'm good in a crisis. <laughs> Well, look, it's been really lovely to talk to you. Thank you for being my uh, what, first guest, my warm-up man, in a way. Uh, oh, no, it's, uh, no! It's behind me! <laughs> uh, it's been really... And do check out uh, is the Comedians Comedian ComCom pod. Uh, it's at ComCom pod on yeah. Twitter, and you yeah. can get it from comedianscomedian.com. Or, but it's better to get it... They explain this at the podcast festival. It's better to go to iTunes to direct people to iTunes, because then they're more, they can hit subscribe more easily. Oh, OK, all right. Like, yes, I've got you now. Go to iTunes. It's genuinely... And there's 100 and... You know, as, I, as we're speaking, there's 100 41 episodes there may be even more by the time you hear this it's really perfect for working out to do a workout to it uh, I, I like to imagine that some people fuck to it <laughs> I'm, I mean it must I'm sure it they must do. have done it's had three and a half million downloads that must have happened <laughs> once but, but to it do you think they're going well here we go to it I mean it might happen no, it was on happy. and people started having sex but do they go Let's turn on the yeah. goals. Hey, <laughs> please, someone do that. And someone will, someone listening to this will do it because your fans are lunatics. <laughs> please do that and send me a... Don't send me anything. <laughs> do it and don't send anything or say anything to anyone. Ladies and gentlemen, he's the best podcast interviewer in the UK of comedians. It's Stuart Goldsmith. Give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>